We're, we're in this series, though, Seasons is what it's called, Seasons. And what we're learning this season is, in this series is that God has a rhythm and a pace. And if you want to experience like success in God's favor and his blessings, it, it, much of it relies on, on understanding and then cooperating with God's timing, with the season that he has you in. And so just like there's seasonal patterns of the weather, which we're in the time change right now, which is why a lot of you at the third service that usually ain't here, right? Right. So we have the time change and the weather patterns change, the leaves you know, fall off trees and then the leaves just grow back on trees. And that's, there's, there's a reason for all of that. There are, listen, there are seasons where things have to fall off you in order for God to do something new inside of you. To everything, there's a season. Can I get an amen? I'm already preaching in the introduction, all right? Here, here's the, if, it, the theme verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. You should have a handout in your bulletin. We have a lot of the scriptures up here. To everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So we've been talking about the different seasons, four primary seasons, really, that um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 goes into a lot of different seasons, but the four primary ones we've been talking about, if you miss any of them, you can catch up online. Part one was a season of harvest, and what we, what we titled that message is Handle Your Harvest. You have, to be, you have to handle your harvest, and how you handle the harvest in one season determines the harvest you will receive in the next season. And so we talked about that. Whatever the harvest is, whether it's financial or your energy, your relationships, whatever you're receiving from that which you're sowing is your harvest. And so we, we talked about handling that, that. There's a season of increase that God brings into our lives, and we need to handle. We need to recognize it and handle the harvest when it comes in. Part two, which was last week, was the season of famine. And we don't like those seasons of drought and dryness or, or famine. But like the scripture says, to everything there's a season, there's a purpose. For everything. And in, even in the middle of the, the famine, I mean, if we stay in step and in season, there is purpose in the middle. We'll find God's purpose in the middle of that famine. And while it's easy to sow seeds in harvest season, it's easy to walk by faith when it's harvest, but, but it's harder to, right, to plant seeds of faith in the middle of the famine. But that's where it's needed most, right? Faith isn't faith unless it shows up when tested, somebody, you guys. So it's in the middle of the famine that faith is proved. It's where, that's where we need to actually plant seeds so that we can reap something in the next season. So that week, if you missed it last week, it was called Faith for the Famine. And, and that was a real, uh, if you're in one of those seasons, I'd really encourage you. If you're in like a drought season, a dry season, I really encourage you to check out part two, last week's message, Faith for the famine. This week, you guys, we're going into verse 8, actually speaks about this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There is a time for war and a time for peace. These next two weeks, today and next week, closing out this series of seasons is going to be war, a season of war we'll study today, and a season of peace that we'll study next week. What you need to know about these seasons, though, is that they, they don't necessarily exist separate from each other. Actually, they, they, they coincide with each other. And what I want to share with you today is that we're actually living in a season of war. Now, I'm not talking about physically. I'm not talking about like the United States or physical war kind of happening. I'm talking about spiritually. The, the, the prophetic calendar of the Word of God, what we are in right now in our time, is a season of war. And if you don't, if you don't know that, if you, don't, if you can't understand that, and cooperate with God in his pace and rhythm and what he's doing right now in this season, the season of war, that it has disastrous consequences. Every, anytime you're out of step with God and out of season, there's always consequences. But, but this one here, it, it, carries, it carries probably the heaviest consequences of them all when you're out of step, when it's a season of war and you're not understanding it, you're not recognizing it, you're not cooperating with it, that the... the the effects and the results, the consequences are disastrous. I talked about in week number one, just introducing this thought that, that when Jesus came to the earth, he came, the, the religious leaders thought it was a season of war and that when the Messiah came, that he would come to bring a sword, that he would come and take back the throne and overthrow Roman rule of government. And there would be like the Jewish nation would rise and, and they were out of step. They didn't know that Jesus was coming as a man of peace, not as a man of war. And because of that, because they were out of step, 
They were just out of season. They didn't recognize it. They didn't understand it. They didn't cooperate with God's timing. They killed the very Messiah that was meant to bring them peace just because they were out of step, all because they were out of step in this season of war. So I'm going to talk to you about that today on why. Why, why is this a season of war? The season, if you're a child of God or not, doesn't matter. The war is happening in heavenly realms today. And so we need to see that. And I want to kind of Hopefully today is going to be, it's going to be like a rally cry. Today's a war cry to the church of God to, to get engaged with the battle and the war that is already happening. But I've titled today's message, When Kings Go Off to War. When Kings Go Off to War. It's based off, we're going to study um, David and in, in, in King David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, verse 1 and all throughout 11, some of you that don't know, King David was one of the kings of Israel. He was the second king of Israel, and um, he was a mighty warrior, but he was also uh, an influential man of God. He was a, the worshiping warrior. So he was someone who would, who would fight the battles, but then he would you know, have pants off, dance off moments. You know what I mean? So he's, he's, he, was, you know, he was just a crazy on fire for God. Dan, I know that was a little inappropriate. My wife's shaking my head. He just, but he did. It's in the Bible. Michael, you guys remember Michael. Some of you guys know the Bible. Michael was watching him having this moment where he just was dancing his clothes off. And, and anyway, that's not the message anyway. Okay. But it was a time, it, it, there was, it was when kings go off to war. The Bible says in the spring, at a time when kings go off to war. So in that time, there was like an open war season. In the winter, they wouldn't go off to war. It was that, that that space or that place geographically of the world was hard to travel in the, in the winter. It was very wet, so armies, they wouldn't travel. It was in springtime that it was open season, that it was wartime. So in spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David didn't. David didn't, and when he usually does, something happened to David, and we're going to talk about that because all of us can get out of step. Every one of us can get out of position really easily. David sent Joab out with the king's man. That was his his head of his armies, and the whole Israelite army, they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. David was out of position, you guys. He was out of alignment. He was out of step. He was out of season, and he didn't get there like, like fast, like quickly. There was like I want to show you the progression of how we today, you may be a child of God today, you may be someone who, who knows Jesus, you may not know, but you can probably find yourself in one of these stages of being out of position with God. Write them down in your notes, you guys. Here's number one, how we can get just out of step, out of position in a season of war. And it starts like this. It starts with comfort. You know, we especially us in our culture, man, in our, this is the age we live in, and we got all kinds of comforts, man. You got, you got your Tempur-Pedic bed, you got your alarm that you set, you got your cars that take you, we just got, you got fast food on the way, you got, we just got all these comforts, you guys, and usually when we, when we think about this word comfort, we, we relate this word most of the time to God's presence, like, oh, and, and, and then we relate confrontation to the devil, which actually, most often, that's the opposite. God is the one that is confronting us. And the devil is the one trying to keep us comfortable. Why? So you don't need God. That's why. So here in the story, we see God wants David to be on the front lines. God wants David to confront the enemy, to be on the front of the confrontation. But David is off being comfortable in his comfort zone. You may not know this, but you might even be, you think you're fighting the devil, but you might be resisting God. God, God is often the one who's, who's challenged us to get outside of our comfort zone. And, and when you get outside of your comfort zone, there's an element of like fear that you have to face with that. Outside of your comfort zone or even confrontation in and of itself, there is an element of, of fear, but, but the enemy of faith isn't fear. The enemy of faith is familiarity. That's what it's because in your in your fear, when you have fear, that can drive us to to act with courage. That can drive fear can drive you to to t take a step of faith and go okay, all right. That's what, but familiarity can cause you to stay at home when kings should be off to war. When you're in your comfort zone, trapped in your comfort zone, your creature comfort. Second Samuel chapter eleven, continuing verse two. 
It says, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed. He got up from it. Now the nap wasn't, it wasn't wrong to take a nap. Where are my nappers out there? Any nappers out there? It's not, it wasn't wrong to take a nap for David. It was, it wasn't the nap that was wrong. It was his position. His position was wrong. He was, he was comfortable. He was supposed to be out at war and instead he was comfortably taking naps. He was resting in a season of war. David got comfortable in his castle. He, he let the, the, the prosperity of his kingdom. You know, when he, he was, when he was young, David actually, he lived in caves. You remember that? He was in the cave of Ajulam being prepared to be king, holding on to a promise with his band of brothers. And now after he has his kingdom and he's in his palace, he sends his band of brothers off to war where he stays in his, in his comfort zone. So this is, this is where a lot of us can be today. Maybe you're a child of God. Maybe you have faith, but you are stuck in your comfort zone. And that is, that is a first step of being out of position towards a very dangerous slope that we're on. Here's the second stage that David goes to, and that is complacency. Complacency. What hurts our faith is rarely the conflict. It's really, it's really our complacency that'll hurt your faith the most. The enemy of destiny is complacency. It's not doing what you know you should do when you know you should do it. Timing is everything. Can I get an amen, somebody? Timing is everything. I looked up the definition of complacency. It's defined as a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, often unaware of some of the potential dangers, defect, or the like. It says a smug self-satisfaction with an existing condition. Ah, we get complacent in the condition that we're in. And it's easy to allow complacency to drift in when we are living a life uh, in our comfort zone. Uh, 1 Samuel continues, chapter 11, verse 2. It says, in the evening when David, I want you to picture this. David gets up in the evening and he walks on the roof of his house. Now, they didn't have porches or anything back then. When they, they would go, if they wanted to go chill out in the front porch, that's like going up to the, to the roof, okay? This word for walked in the Hebrew, it means to pace back and forth. I want, you, I want you to picture this with me, guys, because David gets up in the middle of the night and he goes in his roof and he starts pacing back and forth. Why do you think he's pacing? Because he knows he's not where he's supposed to be. And you, when, you, when you are not where you know you're supposed to be, you know it, don't you? When you're not where God wants you to be, when God wants you to be there, when you're out of step and you're out of position, you kind of... You have this restlessness. There's no peace. You're restless. And here is David. His brothers are off to war. He knows he should be there. He should be fighting that battle with his brothers, and he can't sleep. He gets up. He starts pacing because he knows he's out of step. He's out of alignment. He's out of position. He's walking on the roof of the king's house, it says. And then from the roof, it says he saw now, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? Some of you guys know this story. Timing is everything. Time, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time and going to do the wrong action and about to walk into some disaster. So there from the roof, you saw a woman bathing. And then we know that from the story, that's Bathsheba. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. The, the, the danger about being out of step and in your com not only in your comfort zone, but complacency is, is you'll start you'll start looking to fill that void in your life. And you have, you know it, you got no peace. I know I'm not where I should, I should be. And instead of getting back in step and getting back in position, some of us look to find something to fill the void. Oh, man, I know I'm not where I need to be, but oh, doesn't that look, maybe that'll make me happy. I'll take that. Maybe, maybe, maybe this habit, maybe this hobby, maybe this relationship, maybe this fling, maybe this, maybe, maybe this promotion, maybe more of this will satisfy me, and it never does. It just sucks the very life out of you. The longer you stay out of position. And then it gets to this third step, which is what I'm calling compassionless, where the very things we start to fill the void in our life, and when we stay out of step and out of position, it robs you of that compassion. It robs you of your joy. Your enemy wants to, listen, your enemy wants to take away your compassion. He does. It is impossible to stay in step and in season with God without compassion. 
It's, it's impossible. We're told that Jesus, when, when he performed miracles and signs and the wonders, and he says, it says that he was moved with compassion. Compassion is what moves you, but you only be moved when your compassion is greater than your desire for comfort. So, so let me, God was like this. God was going, David, it's time to go to war. It's time to expand the kingdom. It's, it's time to, and David goes, yeah, but this palace is really nice, God. It feels good. I think I'm good. I think I'm good. He's, he's, or, or when God says, hey, hey, son, hey, hey, my daughter, I want to stretch you. I want you to go deeper. I want you to take a step of faith. I want you to risk for me. And you go, yeah, but God, I'm, I'm kind of good right now. I like the way life is right now. You're not going to move, are you? Because your, your compassion is not greater than your desire for your comfort. And that's what happens. That's what happened to David. He was robbed of his compassion. And so, so some, let me ask you, when was the last time you were moved with compassion to step out in faith and do something great? When was the last time you were moved with compassion and you risked something for God? When you confronted the enemy or something for God? When was the last time you were moved with compassion? You know, so th- there used to be some things that broke your heart. Maybe some, for some of us, We used to lose sleep over the fact that people were hungry in our city or dying without knowing Jesus, that there were people who were lost and do not have this hope of salvation that we have. That used to do something to you. But we've been so comfortable and complacent and the enemy is robbing us of our compassion little by little. And maybe that's why we don't move. Maybe that's why we don't take a step of faith. Maybe that's why we don't, we don't, compassion literally means calm with passion, feeling, with feeling, that we are moved with feeling, with compassion. Continuing the story there in verse three, it says, David sent out and inquired about this woman. And someone said, one of his servants most likely said, uh, David, isn't that Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah the Hittite, like David. I'm not sure if you're seeing this right. Like, who are you? You're, you're the example. You're the king. You're the, you're the psalmist. You're the, you're the one who dances for the Lord. You're the one who goes before God's army and marches us into victory. David, you, what, do you know what you're asking? Then David, even despite... Look at this, the lack of compassion that he has. Despite the warning of his servant, David sent messengers and just took her, just committed adultery with her, and she came to him, and he laid with her. And the the sad fact is, is that David had a lot of concubines. He had a lot of wives and concubines, but listen, you can never fully satisfy the lust of your flesh. And it it wasn't really that that. The problem it wasn't even that, that David lusted for and wanted Bathsheba. The real problem was David wasn't satisfied with what God gave him. That was what the real problem was. He was robbed of his compassion and his comfort and his complacency. And then if we're not careful, you, you, can, you can get to this final place where we're just calling today corrupted, where we're just in our heart is corrupted. Thank you so much. Follow along with me, you guys. Now you're full, you're full on corrupt. Your, your, your comforts have made you complacent. Your complacency has robbed you of your compassion and your lack of compassion has now corrupted everything you do. Now you're, you're, you're doing things that you would have never thought you'd do. Like you, maybe you thought about it, but you never thought you'd really do it. Now you're getting in a place where you're, it's easy for you to say those things now. And you're just, you're saying things you thought you would never say, doing things you thought you'd never do. 2 Samuel chapter 11 continues. It says, Then David said to Uriah, Now let me, let me kind of back up here in the story that, that we didn't read. You can, it's an it's a awesome story. You can, you can read it. But um, David sleeps with Bathsheba and she gets pregnant. And so David fights to keep it hidden. Instead of fighting the real battles and fighting where he needs to fight, he fights to keep it hidden. So he calls Uriah, the husband, home, hoping that he would sleep with his wife and he can hide this thing and he can pretend that was 
his baby all along. But Uriah is a man of honor and says, no, I'm not going to go home to my wife when my brothers are off to war. I'm not going to go home to my wife. And so puts David in this situation. And now his heart is robbed of compassion and corrupted. It says David saw Uriah and he said, "Uh, wait here today also and tomorrow I'm going to let you depart. But in the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So he writes a letter and he gives it to to, um, Uriah to give to Joab. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. Now we got to, we got to cover this thing up and kill him. Now just, you would never think that this man of God would be responding in this way. All because, all because he was just, it all started with him just being out of position. He was just out of step. And one thing led to another. He didn't take the cues and the clues to, to get back in position, to humble himself and repent. It took, if you go read the story of 2 Samuel 11, it took the prophet Nathan to come and confront David and tell him and put him in front of his a mirror to face up to his sin. And he finally repents, tears his clothes, but not after the deed has been done. And it's not in there, but after corruption, there's consequences. That would have been my, my last note. There is consequences to pay. And he lost, his first son was killed, died. And not only that was his first son killed and died, but, but his kingdom, his family would be forever divided all because he was just, he was just out of position. In a season of war, he decided to play it safe. And, and what, I'm, what I'm here to tell you today, you guys, the church of God, it is a season of war. That the Bible actually declares this, prophesies this. Prophetically speaking, the season that we're in between Jesus' ascension, now he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and we are waiting his return, the return of Christ. Okay, Between this time... The Bible calls this the end times. Do you know that? The Bible calls this a season of war, that there is war happening. And if we don't understand that, if you can't see that and cooperate with God in this season of war, then there are disastrous consequences. Let me show it to you. In in a prophetic word, uh, an Old Testament prophet by the name of Joel prophesied a lot about this age that we're living in today. He says this in Joel chapter 3. He says, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for what? Man, I want to rouse the warriors today, okay? He says, rouse the warriors, prepare for war. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling, he says, say, I am strong. Let the nations be roused. Swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. This is a prophetic word for this day and age we're in. I'm here today to give like a war cry. Today you're getting a battle cry, okay? Because maybe you don't know it, but it's the season of war. And you need to know, you need to know some things in this season. You need to, uh, so here, let me give you guys five things that we need to know in this season, all right? Number one, first, Church, I need you to wake up. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, wake up. Come on, get the crust out of your eyes. Wake up. Wake up, church. So let's stop pretending like it's not there, like there's not really a war. Let's stop pretending like like we can live our life like everybody else lives their life, like there's not heaven and hell in the balance, like our children's souls are not in the balance, like the enemy is not after our marriage and our future and our calling. Let's stop pretending that this isn't a war. Wake up, church. Rouse the warriors, he says. Prepare for war. One of the greatest problems of this war is naivety. We're naive. We like to pretend it's, it's not happening, low by the enemy to sleep, staying in our comfort zone. Listen, all hell is, is not stopping, is working overtime to steal, kill, and destroy. Hell will not stop. We're sounding the alarm, man. It's time to wake up, church. Wake up. Your children need you. Your spouses need you. The gospel, the kingdom that God has entrusted to the church needs us to be on the front lines. Don't wait for a funeral to wake up. 
Don't wait for your kids to bring home a positive pregnancy test to wake up. Don't wait. Don't wait for you to be sleeping in separate rooms for you to start fighting for your marriage now. Don't wait for the season of war is already over and victory is forfeit. Wake up. This is the season of war. And you need to, we need to understand it. You need to cooperate with this season. Let me give you a few verses. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, So then, let's not be like the others. Hey, you can't, you can't live like everybody else. You can't act like everybody else, just pretending everything's okay, living for the creature comforts. You, let's stop living like everybody else. They're asleep, the Bible says. They have not been awakened, but let us be alert and self-controlled. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says it like this, Be self-controlled and alert. You have an enemy. Your enemy knows it's war, and he's not stopping. Your enemy knows he's in a battle. Your enemy knows there's war. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, and we like to pretend he's not there, pretend he's not after. Look, the, the devil wants to steal everything that God has given you to steward. Do you know that? That's what he wants. To, he, the, the devil wants to steal everything. So what, God is, God is giving you what? He's giving you peace. And the enemy wants to steal your peace. God has called you a steward. He's given you relationships like a marriage. And the enemy wants your marriage. He's given you children and the enemy's after your children. The enemy, the devil, the, the, God has given you spiritual gifts to be a steward of. And the devil wants to rob you of using those gifts so that we don't get the fruit of those gifts. God has called us to, to be stewards in his church. He has entrusted his kingdom to us. And, he was, and the devil attacks his church. And he wants you to be divided from it and against it and not working within it and a part of it. The enemy will steal whatever God has called us to steward. Most people, though, would like to live in the predictability of their captivity than to risk the uncertainty in a fight for freedom. Can I say that again, somebody, so you guys can receive that? Okay. Most people would rather live in the predictability of their comfort zone in the predictability of their captivity than to step out in faith on the battle lines and risk it all in a fight for your family, in a fight for the gospel, in a fight for God's kingdom. It's, it's, we would rather play it safe back here. We need to wake up, church. Here's number two. Second thing we need to do is wise up. Come on, turn to your neighbor now. Tell him, wise up. Wise up, wise guy. If you're going to fight, you guys, you need to know you need to know how and who. If you're going to fight, you need to know how to fight and who to fight. Because there, there are a lot of us who, who we like to fight meaningless battles, don't we? Battles that really don't matter. They're not eternal battles. They're not, even, they're not battles that God has called us to fight. Yet we, we fight them and we get in there and we fight meaningless battles against lesser opponents. Very often to only reaffirm our own sense of greatness. Look at me, I can beat up these, yeah, I can, oh, look, I can boss them around. We fight meaningless battles. You didn't know who to fight and how to fight. Ephesians chapter six tells us where the battle is really happening. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I'll talk to you about that. But put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, he says, is not against flesh and blood. Look, if you are fighting, if you are fighting against flesh and blood, if, you're, if you are fighting against a person, but leading up to this message, I people ask me, okay, oh, I can't wait to know, when is it time to fight? I'm going to help you out with that in just a moment. But can I, can I answer part of that right now? Um, if you're fighting a person, you're in the wrong, you're already wrong. You're in the wrong fight. Your battle is never a person. If you're postured emotionally or spiritually or, or, or you're postured towards a person like you're fighting them, you are fighting the wrong battle because your fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. That's where our battle is. And if you don't win the war in the heavenlies, you won't win the war on the ground. Let me say it this way. You guys, it, how you fight the war in the air determines the outcome of the battle on the ground. All right? We need to wise up and know who we're fighting and how to fight because the enemy wants to steal, like I said, whatever God has given you 
to steward. Let me, let me give you the weapons of your warfare. There are three weapons that God has given us to fight with, three weapons. One of them is actually mentioned in Ephesians chapter six. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But there are two other weapons the New Testament gives us. Look at the, all three of them, not in your notes, but you, want, you may want to write them down. The word, the name of Jesus, and the blood. Those are the three weapons that God has given us to fight. The word, man, you guys need to know your word. Fall in love with your word. Read it, know it, speak it, confess it, use it. Uh, Jesus did it, right? Every time the enemy would attack, he had a word for the enemy. He had a word for the devil. It is written. This is the only offensive we weapon in Ephesians chapter 10, or Ephesians chapter 6, sorry, that you are, that you are to wield the sword. Then you have, though, the second weapon is the name of Jesus. I mean, the name of Jesus is above every other name. The name of Jesus is greater than the name of cancer. The name of Jesus is greater than the name of anxiety, the name of depression, the name of divorce. Amen. The name of Jesus is greater than, and there is power in the name. But it's, it's not an authority I wield. It's a covering I'm under. Oh, I need you guys to see this, okay? I need you to see this because some of you use the name of Jesus like, like, like it's the sword of the word of God. Some of you use the name of Jesus like, in the name of Jesus. Some of you just get Jesus. <laughs> Jesus! You know, you guys are like throwing, that's not, look, it's not a name that you wield. It's not a weapon. It's not a weapon only, the name isn't a weapon only if it's a name you're under. Okay, it's not an authority you wield, it's an authority you're, you're covering that you're under. In the Old Testament, God's name was Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. In the, in the New Testament, his name is Jesus. You see, when you, when you say in the name of Jesus, you're not throwing the weapon, you are declaring what authority you're under. What you're doing is you're saying in the name of Jesus to cancer, cancer, you can't have me because I'm under the authority of Jesus. You're saying divorce can't have, you can't take my kids. You can't take my kids in the name of Jesus. That's the covering that my family is under. That's, that's in the name of Jesus. And then the blood. The blood is the final blow of victory to the devil. So what battles, what, the battles that you're fighting, that you need to use the word under the name in the blood. If, if, you, if that battle that you're fighting right now if you can't use the word or be under the name and in the blood, it's not a battle worth fighting. That's not what God has called you to fight. Unless you can use the word, be under his name, under his covering, under his authority, and in the blood. You know what the blood, the blood is, is the covenant, right? It's the covenant of grace. It is, it is, it is the security that we have in Christ. It's not based on who I am or what I've done. It's the security that it is done. That he is, that it is finished. So how many, how many battles would you not fight if you really were in the blood, if you really had the security of the blood of Christ? If you, let me say it this way. How many of your battles are you fighting because you have insecurity? So we reach for control because we're insecure. Or we try to manipulate and maneuver behind the scenes in relationships and in situations because I need people to see me a certain way because I'm insecure. How many, how many battles, 90% of our battles, if we, were, if we were operating in the blood, in the security of Christ, knowing who I am and whose I am, I don't need to fight you. I don't need to fight you. I, I'm in the blood of Jesus. I'm under the covering of Jesus. And I use the word of Jesus. Amen, somebody. Are you getting anything out of this today, okay? These are the three weapons that we are called to use. So we need to wise up. Here's number three. We need to fill up. Because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The, the war that we are in cannot be a war you fight in your own power or in your own strength. We need to have, we need to have, an, account, we need to have an encounter with God, you guys. We need to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit of ourselves. All throughout the Bible, God revealed himself through encounters. You know, Moses had his burning bush. Um, uh, David had the times of intimate worship. Paul had his Damascus Road experience. Peter had, in the early church had the upper room in Pentecost. Instead, we find ourselves like reading about these stories. Man, we need to have an encounter of our own church. We need to be filled with the power of God. Ephesians 5 and 18 actually tells us to do that. It says, don't get drunk with wine, 
which is rebellion. Instead, here's what you need to do. Don't be like everybody else. Be filled with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We need a power from God. In all my reading of the Bible, this is why it's so, it's so important, in all my reading of the scriptures, there is nobody who is, who is filled with the Holy Spirit who ever questioned God again in their life. Whoever questioned or doubted God, it is impossible after you have received a touch from God and encountered him to ever question him or walk away from him again. It's impossible. You need your, many of us, we never get beyond a mental relationship. We never get beyond trying to understand God and understand the word. And there is place for that. This is great to have understanding and knowledge but you need more than words. You need power, church. You need to be filled up. That's what 1 Corinthians actually says. Paul says, my message and my preaching were not with wise or persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on sermons or devotions or books. Or Those are all great. Don't get me wrong. Get it, get it, get it, and get it. But your faith needs to rest on God's power. You need a touch from God. You need to say, God, fill me. Actually, before you ever go onto that front line, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen, somebody? Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, not in your notes, but he said that when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power to be my witness. You need to fill up. And then number four, we need to sign up. Because even if you are a follower of Jesus today, maybe you do have faith. You could, you could have faith, but you could still be saying behind the scenes and like, kind of like David David knew God, was a friend of God, but just not where God has called him to be. And maybe for you, some of you just need to say, okay, oh, all right, God. I love it. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, the picture he, that this gives. It says, then I heard Isaiah speaking, the, the prophet, he got a vision from God. It says, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, God send me. I love this verse because in the scriptures preceding this, Isaiah was giving a list of the reasons why he was unqualified to God. He was going, I just can't do it, God. You got the, you got the wrong person. There's no, there's no way. But listen, God's calling and his kingdom, it trumps uh, credentials every time. You are called by God. You are a royal, royal priesthood and a holy nation. And it doesn't matter. In God's kingdom, it doesn't matter about experience and expertise. It, what matters is teachability and availability. What matters is saying, here I am, send me. And if you will only say that, if, you just, if you'll just stay in step with God and say, here I am, God will take you to inaccessible places to do impossible things. If you just say, here I am, send me. Everyone, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Esther, Moses, Samuel, David, Isaiah, all of them have a couple things in common. One, they're all messed up. <laughs> Two, all of them had a moment where they said, okay, God, here I am, send me. I think it's so ironic that most of us, we even have this, in this series, we're, th we're trying to figure out what's, what's the season and the timing. How do I stay in step with God? And what's the season of, of God? And I, what's the time? What am I supposed to do in this season? Most of us kind of fret about that. We worry about that. We wonder about that. But all it really takes, honestly, is for us to say, here I am. Send me. It's God, God's the one who gets us to the destination. That's not up to you. What's up to you is being obedient to the journey and saying, just here I am, God. I don't, I don't understand how it's going to happen. I don't understand how I'm going to win that. I don't understand how my child is ever going to know you or come back to you or how you're going to restore my marriage or how I'm going to do what you've given me a vision to do. Or I, I don't understand how, God, but okay, I'm, I'm stepping out. Here I am. Send me. We need to sign up. Some of you need to sign up. And here's number five today, last, last point. Number five, toughen up. You need to toughen up. Punch your neighbor in the shoulder and tell no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do it. Don't, I saw the arms starting to fly. But you got to, man, you got to toughen up for the battle because the impossibilities will never surrender and become possibilities without a fight. That takes a fight. It takes a fight to see the miraculous, to walk in the impossible. It takes a fight to walk by faith. You need to toughen up. Let me give you a few scriptures in closing. Nehemiah chapter 4. Some of you, this is, this is a verse you need, to, you need to memorize or put on, your, put on your, your mirror, put in your car. Don't be afraid of them. 
Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers. Don't let your brothers fight that battle alone. Fight for your sons and your daughters. They're relying on you, your wives and your homes. Don't be afraid. Stop living in comfort zone. Stop acting like the enemy is not after whatever God has given you to steward and start fighting. Start fighting. Luke chapter 10 tells us, Jesus says, he kind of gives us the reason, another reason why we should fight. He says, because I've given you authority. That's why. You're not fighting like everybody else is fighting. I actually gave you a winning hand. I've given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Do you hear that, church? You step out in faith. You do what God has called you to do. You say yes. You say, here I am. You say yes to God. Nothing, God's word, nothing will harm you. In every season, there is purpose. Nothing will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. God has given you authority. God has already done it. It's already won, honestly. You're fighting a battle that's already, it's already won. You need to know that you don't fight for victory, you fight from victory. Look, victory is not based on you. That's not, victory is not based on you. It's placed on you. You are victorious. You are a conqueror. You are overcomer. It is done. You just need to get engaged with the fight. It's not that there isn't a fight. There is a fight. You need to engage in the war, but you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 57, last verse, real quick. But thanks be to God, listen, he gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you need to receive that. You have victory in that battle. You have victory over your enemy. You have victory for your marriage. You have victory over everything that God has called you to steward that the enemy is trying to take. There is victory in the name of Jesus. Amen? Go ahead and bow your heads. Let me pray for you, church.